All right, so book 19 is called Recognitions and a Dream. Uh, I just wanted to go over, first of all, some key players in the book. We have Telemachus and Odysseus, of course. Ericleia is this very old maid. Um, she took care of Odysseus when he was young. And, of course, we have Athena popping in, doing her thing. We have Penelope, who you know, and then Melantho. She was a maid who was briefly mentioned in book 18, which we skipped. Uh, she's a mistress to Eurymachus, who was, as you know, one of the worst suitors. And uh, in this book, she verbally abuses Odysseus. So she kind of has that job to play. So page 353. Now, by Athena's side in the quiet hall, studying the ground for slaughter, Lord Odysseus turned to Telemachus. The arms, he said. Harness and weapons must be out of sight in the inner room, and if the suitors miss them, be mild. Just say, I had a mind to move them out of the smoke. They seem no longer the bright arms that Odysseus left at home when he went off to Troy. Here, where the fire's hot breath came, they had grown black and drear. One better reason struck me, too. Suppose a brawl starts up when you've been drinking. You might, in madness, let each other's blood, and that would stain your feast, your courtship. Iron itself can draw men's hands. So, uh, once again, we have a repetition of the plan. You know, the old, oh, I just had to go out to the bathroom. What did I miss from the minstrel as I was outside? Okay, so you're caught up. Here we are, line 19. Then he fell silent, and Telemachus obeyed his father's word. He called Ericleia the nurse and told her, Nurse, go shut the women in their quarters while I shift father's armor back to the inner rooms, these beautiful arms unburnished, caked with black soot in his years abroad. I was a child then. Well, I am not now. I want them shielded from the draft and smoke. And the old woman answered, It is time, child. You took an interest in such things. I wish you'd put your mind on all your house and chattels. But who will go along to hold a light? You said, no maids, no torchbearers. Telemachus looked at her and replied, Our friend here, a man who shares my meat can bear hand, no matter how far he is from home. He spoke so soldierly, her own speech halted on her tongue. Straight back she went to lock the doors of the women's hall, and now the two men sprang to work, father and princely son, loaded with round helms and studded bucklers, lifting the long spears, while in their path Pallas Athena held up a golden lamp of pure life. So see, Athena's even helping them out. Telemachus at last burst out, burst out Oh, father! Here is a marvel. All around I see the walls and roof beams, pedestals and pillars lighted as though by white fire blazing near. One of the gods of heaven is in place. So he can't see her, but he does recognize the light. Then said Odysseus, the great tactician, Be still. Keep still about it. Just remember it. The gods who rule Olympus make this light. You may go off to bed now. Here I stay to test your mother and her maids again. Out of her long grief, she will question me. Telemachus went across the hall and out under the light of torches, crossed the court to the tower chamber where he had always slept. Here now again he lay waiting for dawn, while in the great hall by Athena's side, Odysseus waited with his mind on the slaughter. Presently, Penelope from her chamber stepped in her thoughtful beauty. So might Artemis or golden Aphrodite have descended. And maids drew to the hearth her own smooth chair, inlaid with silver whorls and ivory. Okay, so why compare her to Artemis and Aphrodite? This is kind of important. Artemis was a goddess who was a huntress, wise, never wanted to get married, and she eluded many men. So we've got the same thing going on here with Penelope and all those suitors. She doesn't want to get married to any of them. And yet she's also compared to Aphrodite because Aphrodite, being the goddess of love, makes sense for the relationship Penelope is in and has continued to hold fast to in terms of Odysseus. She's loyal to him and loves him. So 
It might seem strange that she's compared to these two goddesses, but once you understand a little bit of their history and what they're in charge of and that kind of thing, then you're like, oh, I get it. That makes sense. She could be like both of them. The artisan Icmalius had made it long before with a footrest in a single piece, and soft upon the seat a heavy fleece was thrown. Here by the fire the queen sat down. Her maids, leaving their quarters, came with white arms bare to clear the wine cups and the bread and move the trestle boards where men had lingered drinking. Fiery ashes out of the pine chip flares they tossed and piled on fuel for light and heat. And now, a second time, Melantho's voice reigned brazen in Odysseus's ears. Ah, stranger, are you still here, so creepy late at night, hanging about, looking the women over? You old goat, go outside, cuddle your supper, get out, or a torch may, torch may kindle you behind. At this, Odysseus glared under his brows and said, Little devil, why pitch into me again? Because I go unwashed and wear these rags and make the rounds. But so I must, being needy. This is the way a vagabond must live. And do not overlook this. In my time, I too had luck, lived well, stood well with men, and gave alms often to poor wonders. Like him you see before you, I, to all sorts, no matter in what dire want, I owned servants, many, I say, and all the rest that goes with what men call prosperity. But Zeus, the son of Cronus, brought me down. Mistress, mend your ways, or you may lose all this vivacity of yours. What if her ladyship were stirred to anger? What if Odysseus came in? I can tell you there is hope of that. Or if the man is done for, still his son lives to be reckoned with by Apollo's will. None of you can go wantoning on the sly and fool him now. He is too old for that. So again, cautioning and kind of saying, watch out if uh, Odysseus doesn't make it home. Telemachus has kind of come into his own. He's a young man now. Penelope, being near enough to hear him, spoke out sharply to her mate. So now she again starts to lay into Melanthio. Oh, shameless through and through. And do you think me blind, blind to your conquest? It will cost your life. You knew I waited for you, heard me say it, waited to see this man in hall and question him about my lord. I am so hard beset. She turned away and said to the housekeeper, Iriname, a bench, a spread of sheepskin, to put my guest at ease. Now he shall talk and listen and be questioned. Willing hands brought a smooth bench and dropped a fleece upon it. Here the adventure and king sat down. Then carefully Penelope began. Friend, let me ask you first of all, who are you? Where do you come from? Of what nation and parents were you born? And he replied, My lady, never a man in the wide world should have a fault to find with you. Notice he hasn't answered her question politician. Your name has gone out under heaven like the sweet honor of some God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong. His black lands bear both wheat and barley, fruit trees laden bright, new lambs at lambing time, and the deep sea gives great hauls of fish by his good strategy, so that his folk farewell. He just pushes away her question with a bunch of flattery. Oh, my dear lady, this being so, let it suffice to ask me of other matters. Not my blood, my homeland. He doesn't want to answer that question because he doesn't want to lie about that. Do not enforce me to recall my pain. My heart is sore, but I must not be found sitting in tears here in another's house. It is not well forever to be grieving. One of the maids might say, or you might think I had got maudlin over cups of wine. And Penelope replied, Stranger, my looks, my face, my carriage were soon lost or faded when the Achaeans crossed the sea to Troy. Oops, I have to change this. This is Penelope saying how she is getting old. So she pushes off his flattery. 
Odysseus, my lord among the rest, if he returned, if he were here to care for me, I might be happily renowned, but grief instead have sent me, years of pain, sons of the noblest families on the islands, Dulichian, Same, wooded Zacinuths, and native Ithacans are, are here to court me against my wish, and they consume this house. Can I give proper heed to guest or suppliant or herald on the realm's affairs? How could I, wasted with longing for Odysseus, while here they press for marriage? To draw the time, rules served my turn, to draw the time out, first a close-grained web. I had the happy thought to set up weaving on my big loom in hall. Okay, here she's going to tell her weaving story again. We've heard it how many times? One more, just in case you missed it. I said that day, young man, my suitors, now my lord is dead. Let me finish my weaving before I marry, or else my thread will have been spun in vain. It is a shroud I weave for Lord Laertes, when cold death comes to lay him on his bier. The country wives would hold me in dishonor, if he with all his fortune lay unshrouded. I reached their hearts that way, and they agreed. So every day I wove on the great loom, but every night by torchlight I unwove it. And so for three years I deceived the Achaeans, but when the seasons brought a fourth year on, as long months waned and the long days were spent through impudent folly in the slinking maids, they caught me, clambered up to me at night. I had no choice then but to finish it. And now... As matters stand at last, I have no strength left to evade a marriage, cannot find any further way. My parents urge it upon me, and my son will not stand by while they eat up his property. He comprehends it, being a man full grown, able to oversee the kind of house Zeus would endow with honor. But you, too, confide in me. Tell me your ancestry. You were not born of mythic oak or stone, and the great master of invention answered so again she's kind of like tell me your background who are you where are you from and again he's going to step around that question oh honorable wife of lord odysseus must you go on asking about my family then i will tell you that my pain be doubled by it and whose pain would not if he had been away as long as i have and had hard roving in the world of men but I will tell you even so, my lady, one of the great islands of the world in mid-sea in the wine-dark sea is Crete, spacious and rich and populous, with ninety cities and a mingling of tongues. Achaeans there are found, along with Cretan hillmen of the old stock, and Cadonians, Dorians, and three bloodlines, Pelasgians, and one among their ninety town is, towns is Knossos. Here lived King Minos, whom great Zeus received every ninth year in private council. Minus, the father of my father, Deucalion. Now that's interesting. So Odysseus is related to King Minus. Two sons Deucalion had, Idomeneus, who went to join the Atridae before Troy, in the beaked ships of war, and then myself, Ithan by name, a stripling next my brother. But I saw with my own eyes at Nasus once, Odysseus because part of that story is true, um, that he is related to Deucalion. We heard that earlier from Telemachus. Anyway, back to his fake tale here. Gales had caught him off Cape Malia, driven him southward on the coast of Crete when he was bound for Troy. At Amnissus, hard by the holy cave of Ulithuia, he lay to and dropped anchor in that open and rough roadstead, riding out the blow. Meanwhile, he came ashore, came inland, asking, af as asking after Idomeneus, dear friends, he said they were. But now ten mornings had already passed, ten or eleven since my brother sailed, so I played host and took Odysseus home, saw him well lodged and fed, for we had plenty. Then I made requisitions, barley, wine, and beeves for sacrifice, to give his company abundant fare along with him. Twelve days they stayed with us, the Achaeans, while that wind out of the north shut every one inside. Even on land you could not keep your feet. Such fury was abroad. On the thirteenth, when the gale dropped, they put out to sea. Now all these lots he made appear so truthful. She wept as she sat listening. 
The skin of her pale face grew moist, the way pure snow softens and glistens on the mountains, thawed by south wind after powdering from the west. And as the snow melts, mountain streams run full, so her white cheeks were wetted by these tears shed for her lord, and he close by her side. Homeric simile alert! She's being compared to a mountain filled with snow thawing out because she's crying that much. Imagine how his heart ached for his lady, his wife in tears, and yet he never blinked. His eyes might have been made of horn or iron for all that she could see. He had this trick, wept if he willed to, inwardly. Well then, as soon as her relieving tears were shed, she spoke once more. I think that I shall say, friend, Give me some proof, if it is really true, that you were host in that place to my husband. With his brave men, as you declare, come tell me the quality of his clothing, how he looked in some particular of his company. Odysseus answered, and his mind ranged far. Lady, so long a time now lies between, it is hard to speak of it. Here is the twentieth year since that man left the island of my father, but I shall tell what memory calls to mind. A purple cloak and fleecy he had on, a double thick one. Then he wore a brooch made of pure gold with twin tubes for the prongs, and on the face a work of art, a hunting dog pinning a spotted fawn in agony between his forepaws, Wonderful to see how being gold and nothing more, he bit the golden deer, convulsed with wild hooves flying. Odysseus is sure I noticed too, a fine clothes fitting tunic like dry onion skin, so soft it was and shiny. Women there, many of them, would cast their eyes on it. But I might add for your consideration whether he brought these things from home or whether a shipmate gave them to him coming aboard. I, I have no notion. Some regardful host in another port, perhaps it was. A faction followed him. There were few Achaeans like him. And I, too, made him gifts, a good bronze blade, a cloak with lining and a broidered shirt, and sent him off in his trim ship with honor. A herald somewhat older than himself, he kept beside him. I'll describe this man, round-shouldered, dusky, woolly-headed. Eurybates, his name was, and Odysseus gave him preferment over the officers. He had a shrewd head like the captain's own. Now hearing these details, minutely true, she felt more strangely moved, and tears flowed until she tasted her salt grief again. Then she found words to answer. Before this, you won my sympathy, but now indeed you shall be our respected guest and friend. With my own hands I put that cloak and tunic upon him, took them folded from their place, and the bright brooch for ornament. Gone now, I will not meet the man again, returning to his own home fields, Unkind the fate that sent him, young in the long ship, to see that misery at Ilion, unspeakable. And the master improviser answered, Honorable wife of Odysseus Laertiades, you need not stain your beauty with these tears, nor wear yourself out grieving for your husband. Not that I can blame you. Any wife grieves for the man she married in her girlhood, lay with in love, bore children too, though he may be no prince like this Odysseus, whom they compare even to the gods. But listen, weep no more, and listen. So he's telling her to stop grieving. Kind of a double meaning there. I mean, he doesn't want to see her suffer anymore, but he also wants her to stop crying. Um, he wants to give her some comfort. So as the stranger, he's saying stop crying, but as Odysseus too, he's saying stop crying. Okay, continuing on, page 362, but line 321. I have a thing to tell you, something true. I heard but lately of your lord's return. Heard that he is alive, not far away, among the Thesprochians in their green land. Good news! Amassing fortune to bring home. His company went down in shipwreck in the wine-dark sea off the coast of Thrinacia. Zeus and Helios held it against him that his men had killed the kind of Helios. The crew drowned for this. Aha, finally, he's telling some truth here. 
He rowed the ship's keel. Big seas cast him up on the island of the Phaeacians, godlike men who took him to their hearts. They honored him with so many gifts and a safe passage home, or so they wished. Kind of skipped the whole Calypso's Island thing there, didn't he? They honored him with many gifts and a safe passage home, or so they wished. Long since he should have been here, but he thought better to restore his fortune playing the vagabond about the world. And no adventurer could beat Odysseus by living at his by his wits. No man alive. I had this from King Phaedon of Thesprotia. And tipping wine out, Phaedon swore to me the ship was launched, the seamen standing by, to bring Odysseus to his land at last. But I got out to sea ahead of him by the king's order, as it chanced a freighter left port for the grain bins of Dulichion. Phaedon, however, showed me Odysseus's treasure. Ten generations of his heirs or more could live on what lay piled in that great room. The man himself had gone up to Dodona to ask the spelling leaves of the old oak what Zeus would have him do, how to return to Ithaca after so many years, by stealth or openly. So he's making all this up, but he does include um, how he was consulting the gods for what to do on whether he should return by stealth or openly. So in a way, he's kind of giving away himself a little bit. Page 363. You see, then, he is alive and well, and headed homeward now, no more to be abroad, far from his island, his dear wife and son. Here is my sworn word for it. Witness this. God of the zenith, noblest of the gods, and Lord Odysseus, hearth fire now before me. I swear these things shall turn out as I say, between this present dark and one day's ebb, after the wane, before the crescent moon, Odysseus will come. Penelope, the attentive queen, replied to him, Ah, stranger, if what you say could ever happen, you would soon know our love, our bounty too. Men would turn after you to call you blessed. But my heart tells me what must be. Odysseus will not come to me. No ship will be prepared for you. We have no master quick to receive and furnish out a guest as Lord Odysseus was. Or did I dream him? Okay, now she changes the subject. She wants the maids to clean up the beggar, since she's at least heard news of Odysseus. Maids, maids! Come wash him, make a bed for him, bedstead and colored rugs and coverlets to let him lie warm into the gold of dawn. In morning light you'll bathe him and anoint him so that he'll take his place beside Telemachus feasting in hall. If there be one man there to bully or annoy him, that man wins no further triumph here, burn though he may. How will you understand me, friend? How find in me, more than in common women, any courage or gentleness, if you are kept in rags and filthy at our feast? Men's lives are short. The hard man and his cruelties will be cursed behind his back and mocked in death. But one whose heart and ways are kind, of him strangers will bear report to the wide world, and distant men will praise him. Warily, Odysseus answered, Honorable lady, wife of Odysseus Laertiades, a weight of rugs and cover not for me. I've had none since the day I saw the mountains of Crete white with snow, low on the sea line fading behind me as the long oars drove me north. Let me do lie down tonight, as I've lain often, many a night, unsleeping many a time, a field on hard ground waiting for pure dawn. No, and I have no longing for a footbath either. None of these maids will touch my feet, unless there is an old one, old and wise. One who has lived through suffering as I have. I would not mind letting my feet be touched by that old servant. And Penelope said, Dear guest, no foreign man so sympathetic ever came to my house. No guest more likable, so wry and humble are the things you say. I have an old maid servant, ripe with years, one who in her time nursed my lord. She took him into her arms the hour his mother bore him. Let her, then, wash your feet, though she is frail. Come here, stand by me, faithful Eurycleia, and bathe, bathe your master. I, I, I almost said, for they are of an age, and now Odysseus's hands and feet would be in seams like his. Men grow old soon in hardship. Hearing this, the old nurse hid her face between her hands and wept hot tears and murmured, 
Oh, my child, I can do nothing for you. How Zeus hated you. No other man so much. No use, great heart, O oh, faithful heart, the rich thigh bones you burn to Zeus, who plays in lightning, and no man ever gave more to Zeus with all your prayers for a green age. A tall son reared to manhood. There is no day of homecoming for you. Stranger, some women in far off place perhaps have mocked my lord when he'd be home as now these strumpets mock you here no wonder you keep clear of all their whorishness and have no bath but here am i the queen penelope icarius's daughter bids me so let me bathe your feet to serve my lady to serve you too my heart within me stirs mindful of something Listen to what I say. Strangers have come here many through the years, but no one ever came, I swear, who seems so like Odysseus, body, voice, and limbs, as you do. Ready for this, Odysseus answered. Old woman, that is what they say. All who have seen the two of us remark how like we are, as you yourself had said, and rightly too. Then he kept still while the old nurse filled up her basin, glittering in firelight. She poured cold water in, then hot. But Lord Odysseus whirled suddenly from the fire to face the dark. The scar! He had forgotten that. She must not handle his scarred thigh, or the game was up. But when she bared her lord's leg, bending near, she knew the groove at once. Dom, dom, dom. Okay, we have to break this tension where um, suddenly she's going to recognize who he is and we have to have a flashback. We have to find out how he got this scar on his thigh. An old wound, a boar's white tusk inflict, inflicted on Parnassus years ago. He'd gone hunting there in company with his uncles and Autolycus, his mother's father, a great thief and swindler by Hermes' favor, for Autolycus pleased him with burnt offerings of sheep and kids. The god acted as his accomplice. Well, Autolycus, on a trip to Ithaca, arrived just after his daughter's boy was born. In fact, he had no sooner finished supper than Nurse Ericlea put the baby down in his own lap and said, It is for you now to choose a name for him, your child's dear baby, the answer to her prayers. Atalicus replied, My son-in-law, my daughter, call the boy by the name I tell you. Well, you know my hand has been against the world of men and women. Odium and distrust I've won. Odysseus should be his given name. When he grows up, when he comes visiting his mother's home under Parnassus, where my treasures are, I'll make him gifts and send him back rejoicing. Odysseus in due course went for the gifts, and old Autolycus and his sons embraced him with welcoming sweet words, and Amphith Amphithia, his mother's mother, held him tight and kissed him, kissed his head and his fine eyes. The father called on his noble sons to make a feast, and going about it briskly, they led in an ox of five years, whom they killed and flayed and cut in bits for roasting on the skewers with skilled hands with care, then shared it out. So all the day until the sun went down, they feasted to their heart's content. At evening, after the sun was down and dusk had come, they turned to bed and took the gift of sleep. When the young dawn spread in the eastern sky her fingertips of rose, the men and dogs went hunting, taking Odysseus. They climbed Parnassus, rugged flank mantled in forest, entering amid high windy folds at noon, when Helios beat upon the valley floor, and on the winding ocean whence he came, with hounds questing ahead in open order, the sons of Atelicus went down a glen, Odysseus in the lead behind the dogs, pointing his long shadowing spear. Before them, a great boar lay in the undergrowth, in a green thicket proof against the wind or sun's blaze, fine soever the needling sunlight, impervious too to any rain, so dense that cover was, heaped up with fallen leaves, patter of hound's feet, men's feet, woke the boar, 
as they came up, and from his woolly ambush, with razor back bristling and raging eyes, he trotted and stood at bay. Odysseus, being on top of him, had the first shot, lunging to stick him, but the boar had already charged under the long spear. He hooked a slant with one white tusk and ripped out flesh above the knee, but missed the bone. Odysseus' second thrust went home by luck, his bright spear passing through the shoulder joint, and the beast fell, moaning as life pulsed away. Atalakilis' tall sons took up the wounded, working skillfully over the prince Odysseus to bind his gash, and with a rune they staunched the dark flow of blood. Then downhill swiftly they all repaired to the father's house, and there tended him well, so well, they soon could send him with grandfather Attilicus's magnificent gifts, rejoicing over sea to Ithaca. His father and the lady Anticlea welcomed him and wanted all the news of how he got his wound. So he spun out his tail, recalling how the boar's white tusk caught him when he was hunting on Parnassus. Now the flashback's done. This was the scar the old nurse recognized. She traced it under her spread hands, then let go, and into the basin fell the lower leg, making the bronze clang, slashing the water out. Then joy and anguish seized her heart. Her eyes filled up with tears, her throat closed, and she whispered with hand held out to touch his chin. Oh, yes. You are Odysseus. Ah, dear child, I could not see you until now. Not till I knew my master's very body with my hands. Her eyes turned to Penelope with desire to make her lord, her husband, known in vain because Athena had bemused the queen so that she took no notice, paid no heed. At the same time, Odysseus's right hand gripped the old throat. His left hand pulled her near, and in her ear he said, Will you destroy me, nurse, who gave me milk at your own breast? Now, with a hard lifetime behind, I've come. In the twentieth year home to my father's island, you found me out as the chance was given you. Be quiet. Keep it from the others else, I warn you. And I mean it too. If by my hand God brings the suitors down, I'll kill you, nurse or not, when the time comes, when the time comes to kill the other women. Eurycleia kept her wits and answered him. Oh, what mad words are these you let escape you? Child, you know my blood. My bones are yours. No one could whip this out of me. I'll be a woman turned to stone. Iron I'll be. And let me tell you to mine now. If God cuts down the arrogant suitors by your hand, I can report to you on all the maids, those who dishonor you and the innocent. So she, of course, is not going to rat him out and... Um, She's going to point out to him who are the good maids, who are the bad maids. So she's in on it now. But in response, the great tactician said, Nurse, no need to tell me tales of these. I will have seen them, each one for myself. Trust in the gods. Be quiet. Hold your peace. Silent, the old nurse went to fetch more water, her basin being all spilt. When she had washed and rubbed his feet with golden oil, he turned, dragging his bench against the fireside for warmth, and hid the scar under his rags. Penelope broke the silence, saying, Friend, allow me one brief question more. You know the time for bed. Sweet rest is coming soon. If only that warm luxury of slumber would come to enfold us in our trouble. But for me, my fate at night is... Anguish and no rest. By day being busy, seeing to my work, I find relief sometime from loss and sorrow. But when night comes and all the world's abed, I lie in mine alone, my heart thudding, while bitter thoughts and fears crowd on my grief. Think how Pandarius's daughter, pale forever, sings as the nightingale in the new leaves, through those long, quiet hours of night on some thick 
flowering orchard bough in spring. How she rills out and tilts her note high now, now low, mourning for Italus, whom she killed in madness her child, and her lord Zethus's only child. My forlorn thought flows variable as her song, wondering, shall I stay beside my son and guard my own things here, my maids, my hall, to honor my lord's bed in the common talk? Or had I best join fortunes with a suitor, the noblest one, most lavish in his gifts? Is it now time for that? My son, being still a callow boy, forbade marriage or absence from my lord's domain. But now the child is grown, grown up a man. He too begins to pray for my departure, aghast at all the suitors, poor John. Listen, interpret me this dream. From a water's edge, twenty fat geese have come to feed on grain beside my house, and I delight to see them. But now a mountain eagle with great wings and crooked beak storms in to break their necks and strew their bodies here. Away he soars into the bright sky, and I cry aloud all this in dream. I wail, and round me gather, softly braided a key and women mourning because the eagle killed my geese. Then down out of the sky he drops to a cornice beam with mortal voice, telling me not to weep. Be glad, says he, renowned Icarus' daughter. Here is no dream, but something real as day, something about to happen. All these geese were suitors, and the bird was I. See now I am no eagle, but your lord come back to bring in glorious death upon them all. As he said this, my honeyed slumber left me. Peering through half-shut eyes, I saw the geese in hall, still feeding at the self-same trough. So she kind of throws two things at him. The first one is, oh, you know, maybe I should marry one of the suitors. And then she has this dream, she tells him. And that one sounds like she's expecting Odysseus to come back. The master of subtle ways and straight replied, My dear, how can you choose to read the dream differently? Has not Odysseus himself shown you what is to come? Death to the suitors, sure death too. Not one escapes his doom. Penelope shook her head and answered. Friend, many and many a dream is mere confusion. A cobweb of no consequence at all. Two gates for ghostly dreams there are, one gateway of honest horn and one of ivory. Issuing by the ivory gate are dreams of glimmering illusion, fantasies, but those that come through solid polished horn may be borne out if mortals only know them. I doubt it came by horn my fearful dream too good to be true that, for my son and me, but one thing more I wish to tell you, listen carefully. It is a black day. This that comes, Odysseus's house and I are to be parted. I shall decree a contest for the day. We have twelve axe heads in his time. My lord could line them up, all twelve, at intervals like a ship's ribbing. Then he'd back away, a long way off, and whip an arrow through. Now, I'll impose this trial on the suitors. The one who easily handles and strings the bow and shoots through all twelve axes I shall marry. Whoever he may be, then look my last on this, my first love's beautiful brimming house. But I'll remember, though I dream it only. Okay, so all of a sudden she comes up with this plan, something Odysseus used to do with his axe heads, line him up and then shoot an arrow through. And she said, mm, I'll see which suitor can do this and then I'll marry him. So think about this really carefully. If she doesn't think Odysseus is this beggar here, why does she kind of coyly say, oh, maybe I should marry the suitor? Why does she tell this dream? Why does she suddenly have this inspiration for a trial after enduring the suitors for all these years? She is putting out some tests to really see if this beggar is Odysseus. But we're not getting her point of view at all just hearing her words and seeing her actions. So we're not getting what's going on inside her mind. We just have to kind of read into it as much as we can. Odysseus said, Dear Honorable Lady, wife of Odysseus, Laertiades, let there be no postponement of the trial. Odysseus, who knows the ships of combat, will be here. Aye, he'll be here long before one of these lads can stretch or string that bow or shoot to thread the iron. 
grave and wise Penelope replied, If you were willing to sit with me and comfort me, my friend, no tide of sleep would ever close my eyes. But mortals cannot go forever sleepless. This the undying gods decree for all, who live and die on earth, kind furrowed earth. Upstairs I go then to my single bed, my sighing bed, wet with so many tears after my lord Odysseus took ship to see that misery at Ilion unspeakable. Let me rest there, you hear. You can stretch out on the bare floor, or else command a bed. So she went up to her chamber, softly lit, accompanied by her maids. Once there she wept for Odysseus, her husband, till Athena cast sweet sleep upon her eyes. We're skipping book 20. You're more than welcome to read it. It's called Signs and a Vision. The very end of it is quite interesting. So in this book, Athena visits Odysseus, and we also have Zeus sending some favor favorable omens. Um, the servants kind of get the house ready, um, and then we do get to meet another faithful servant. He's going to be important, Philetius, the loyal cowherd, and Odysseus um, continues to be among the suitors, scoping things out, kind of seeing which are the worst, maybe planning who he should kill first, and then... Um, Telemachus ends up rebuking this suitor, Tisippius, who threw a cow's foot at Odysseus, but Odysseus kind of ducked his head and um, it missed him. Then at the very end, the, remember Theoclim, Theoclimenus, the seer that Telemachus had brought back with him from his little journey? He has this important vision, page 386, 387. Like, if you're going to read any of book 20, read through this. Um, because they are, their, their death is predicted. Athena drives them into nightmare. They wheeze and neigh, and blood defiles their meat. Tears flood their eyes. And uh, through all of this, um, the seer, the Clemenus, says, O law said, man, what terror is this you suffer? And he talks about their cheeks streaming and the walls dripping crimson blood and shades, you know, ghosts all over the place. And then all of a sudden the young men start to laugh and they say, ha, this guy's gone crazy. Get, get rid of him. Take him outside. He finds it dark as night inside. And he says, if I need help, I'll ask for it. I have my ears and eyes and a pair of legs and a straight mind. And he says, I see damnation and black night for you guys. There's no shelter for you. Um, so they just kind of start to heckle Telemachus and says, well, you first you bring in a beggar and now this crazy guy. Who are you going to bring in next? You know, you put should put both those guys on a slave ship. Tell it. Telemachus um, ignored the suitors, and now he is just, you know, watching Odysseus. When is going to be the sign? When are we going to start this fight? When are we going to do this takedown? And Penelope um, has her chair so that she can see down where Odysseus and Telemachus are. She hears the crowd, and the very last words of this book, then preparing for the suitors whose treachery had filled that house with pain. So there's this foreboding that ends chapter or book 20. And that's where we'll end.